Massive playoff implications when the Bengals take on the Chargers. We'll cross over with Locked On Chargers and talk about it. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko. He's your host, James Rapine. Today, we cross over with Locked On Chargers as we begin to preview one of, if not the biggest games so far of the Cincinnati Bengals season. And you might say, what about the Baltimore Ravens game? Well, yeah, that one was a pretty big one, too. I'm not going to argue with you there. But in terms of playoff implications, this one, absolutely massive. We covered it. A couple of days ago on Monday's show, I believe it was Tuesday's show. Sorry, it was Tuesday's show. So if you're interested in the playoff implications and that conversation, go back in time a couple of days, listen to that one. Today, James, we get our first injury report of the week as the Bengals prepare to take on the Chargers. A lot more concerning, I would say, on the Bengals side of things and the Chargers side of things. And I know the Chargers have some guys on IR, so they won't show up on the injured injury list because they're just not playing they're they're on injured reserve but the Bengals Trey Hopkins Riley Reef did not practice and Zach Taylor did say that Riley Reef will not practice today or tomorrow sounds like they're going to try to get him through the walkthrough on Friday sounds like they're somewhat optimistic that he can play even if he doesn't practice but you obviously rather see these guys not battling an injury, right? Being a hundred percent or as close to at this point in the year as you can be instead of having a new acute injury to deal with. And they're trying to manage both of those guys. There's some other guys on the list, but let's start with these two because the Bengals had a long list of non-participants on Wednesday. Yeah, but these are the headliners. These are the ones that uh, could obviously impact number nine the most. And when you got a Bosa on the other side and Joey Bosa, that's scary, especially when you're talking about Isaiah Prince, potentially starting against Bosa. And that's kind of how I asked Zach because, yeah, you can ask him about Riley Reef, And he did say that given how Riley carries himself, he, he does expect him to play, but that could change. So then I naturally followed up with, okay, so is it Isaiah Prince at right tackle if Riley can't go? And he hesitated for a second. And then he said, yeah, that would be the plan. Didn't sound like they have firm – plans. Oh, Isaiah is the guy, which to me says, I think that they're, you know, deep down they're confident that Riley's going to be able to go. So hopefully it's just a couple of almost maintenance rest days. Uh, and not that he's not injured, but that you want to get that injury to maybe 90% versus 80% and him practicing on it and sore and everything like that. As far as Trey Hopkins, here's what's interesting. Well, a couple things. One left Sunday with a knee injury, right? That, that was the designation that the, the team and that the public relations staff uh, th- that they gave us during the game didn't come back to the game. Zach kind of dismissed it at, at being an issue on Monday. And now he's on the injury report with an ankle. So, you know, who knows how hurt he is. We didn't know that Trey was that dinged up because we asked him Monday and it seemed like he was going to play and that he might be limited earlier in the week. Well, now he's a DNP with an ankle that, Seem kind of out of nowhere. So certainly something worth monitoring as we get into Thursday. And hopefully on Thursday, by the time some of you are hearing this, depending on when you're listening, uh, Trey's getting ready for practice or or getting set to uh, take the field, at least in a limited capacity. And if it is an ankle, that actually makes a lot more sense to me than a knee. He did kind of get rolled up on on the knee. But when he got up from that play, my initial reaction, and I think I tweeted this at the time, was his ankle looked like it was it looked like dislocated. It looked like it was pointing in the wrong direction. His foot looked like it was pointing in the wrong direction to me oh. under the pile. And then he got up and yeah. he sta- he actually played the next play before he came out of the game after that drive. So like he stayed in the game at that point. He was slow to get up, didn't show any signs of limping. I, I wonder if that's what it is. I, I-, I really, I-, I guess I'm speculating at this point too, but you hope Trey Hopkins plays for sure. I mean, the, the Chargers interior defensive line, Jerry Tillery, and uh, Justin Jones getting the most playing time there for them. Not terrifying, not Cam Hayward level kind of scary game disrupting guys, but Jerry Tillery does have some athleticism. He did create some problems for the interior of this offensive line last year. And, you know, that being said, no matter what, I think you'd rather have Hopkins than Hill. 
because Trey Hill for whatever his future holds is, is certainly, I don't think as good a player as Trey Hopkins right now, especially with Trey starting to turn the corner a little bit the last couple of weeks. So what you would hate to see is if this sets yeah. him back. Right. And so you hope that's not the case because they're getting really good play from Jonah Williams, from Quentin Spain, from Riley reef. We've talked about these guys this week. Hakeem Adenogy seems to be, you know, at least competent average in his two games so far at right guard. So you're talking in terms of, of PFF grading. I know Zim and our friend ACE, you know, they like to say a whole lot of orange. There's a whole lot of green on the Bengals offense in terms of PFF grading right now. <laughs> and, and you would like to see that continue with some continuity on the offensive line. The other injuries of note for the Bengals to talk about James, probably Chris Evans, Khaled, Kareem, Darius Phillips. Those are the most important ones. But also Auden Tate still dealing with that calf injury that's been lingering for him for weeks now. Well, it, was, and, it was a thigh. It was a thigh. Oh, it's now a calf, calf now. Okay, new so, injury. Then. So yeah, so maybe he tweaked his calf as he was rehabbing, you know, his thigh. But uh, yeah, we'll have to ask Zach about that later this week. Good correction. Good correction. So Cali Kareem, Michael Thomas, a wide receiver, both on on the injury report with illnesses. So hopefully nothing mm-hmm. too severe there. Zach Taylor did say. Players have been tested Monday and Wednesday this week. No COVID. They were more than 0% concerned about Joe Burrow after his close encounter with (laughs) TJ Watt. But so far, sounds like he's okay. But Chris Evans uh, and and Khaled Kareem are both guys that are getting some rotational time. They're they're working their way into more playing time for different reasons. One a rookie, one coming off his own injury in Khaled Kareem. Darius Phillips, if he can't go, leaves you without a kick returner, especially because the second guy was Chris Evans. And so now you're down to Trenton Irwin. I and a punt question returner, mark? Which yeah, is like, scarier I, to I, me. I think it's just Irwin. Maybe Boyd in emergency. And it is just worth noting. And I I guess who knows at this point, they protected Puka Williams this week. I just throwing it out there because I don't think they've protected Great him point. all year. And and so who knows? Maybe maybe that's uh Oh my gosh, I'm going to get the Puka. There is like this little bit of a, a Puka hive among yep. Bengals fans. I'm going to get them so excited by mentioning that. Oh my they, goodness. They also protected Travion Williams, didn't they? They protected both they running did. backs this week. I'm, I'm pretty sure they did, yeah. So Just to douse uh, that that hive real quick. They, they protected both running backs on the practice squad. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, but Puka's not a running – like, I don't really consider right. him that. I don't know what the right. hell he is. He's a special teams weapon guy that sounds better in Madden than he does in real life, but, you know, who knows? It may, may, here's the thing. If he's on the Built Bar plan – I haven't paid attention to Puka. If he's on the Built Bar plan, my guy might be ready to go in the NFL and, 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 and be ready to, uh, you know, return a couple kicks or punts. And so, But that is the thing is who would it be? I think Trent Taylor would be the guy punt return wise that I would use if, if I needed to use him. I think he's still probably the best punt returner on the team, even though Darius Phillips has been better uh, over the past couple of weeks. You're talking uh, practice squad call up for Trent Taylor. Was he protected this week? I, I thought it was he, he the would, running backs. and No, he, he wasn't protected. I, I'm just, that's just my opinion. Like if I had to pick someone to return, if Darius Phillips is out, I would lean Taylor that being said, it does feel like if, if they protected Williams, maybe there's something there. Maybe that's going to be the guy. Maybe he'll get the call. And it wouldn't be crazy because last week, what did they do? They they called up Thaddeus Moss, and it, there was at least a plan to get him on the field. And unfortunately, he had he got injured in warm-ups. So maybe they're taking a look at some of these young guys that uh, have been slugging away on the practice squad, and maybe they feel good about them and, and about their chances of, of making an impact if needed. It would have to be the Puka Williams could also cover kicks. I don't think they can call a player up and use a roster spot only for kick returning, but but maybe they do. Maybe they have some plays in for him too, because you're right. Trent Irwin is only on the depth chart currently. The official depth chart on Bengals.com, as far as I can tell, is a punt returning. Second tier, second stringer, not second tier. Uh, Chris Evans and Darius Phillips are only guys listed at kick returners. So the kick returner... I, that that's where the Puka Williams thing might make a little bit more sense to me, but I think you would have to be able to cover some kicks too, in some capacity because Chris Evans does that. And Darius mm-hmm. Phillips does that. And they'll need to replace those guys on special teams as well. And Zach Taylor talked about the chargers have a guy that can return kicks. So maybe talk about that a little bit later. Maybe not. Maybe we'll focus offense defense, regardless coming up next, we're going to talk press conference comments mm-hmm. from Wednesday and some offensive 
optimism and, and multifaceted comments, I guess, from Joe Burrow and Zach Taylor. No one plays sports or fantasy sports to lose. Winning feels so much better, especially daily fantasy. And Stat Hero is the first of its kind. It's a daily fantasy platform like no other. Here's the crazy part. You go up against the house in head-to-head fantasy matchups, winner take all, and you see their lineup before the game start. So you know what you're going up against. There's no hidden agenda. There's no hiding and uh, disguising lineups, nothing like that. This isn't 11 on 11. This is head-to-head fantasy. You go up against the house at Stat Hero, and boom, if you put together a better lineup, you get paid. With Stat Hero, you are in control of the stakes. You decide how much you're going to play for, who you're going to play. So check them out right now at stathero.com slash locked on. Make sure you use the promo code locked on for a 100% deposit match. You can win daily fantasy games every single week. The NFL season over halfway over. Take advantage of it right now. Stathero.com slash locked on. And again, use the promo code locked on for a 100% deposit match. Terms and conditions do apply. James, let's talk about the press conferences today. You had some interesting questions. You, James Rapine, our guy on the inside who's able to tell us things like Zach Taylor not being ready on the jump when he's asked about who the right tackle is going to be, giving us that insight into the Bengals' hitting confidence that Riley Reef could be ready on Sunday. You also asked Joe Burrow and Zach Taylor about how the offense has evolved, and this is something that we've talked about This week, we talked about it with Mike on the film review show on Wednesday. What what stood out to you in those quotes? Or maybe just let's play one of them. We really are. You saw it at the beginning of the year. We know we hit a lot of big plays, a lot of big touchdowns. So then teams started to try to take that away. And now Joe Mixon's running for 150 yards a game. And so you really have to pick your poison. You know, people get, you know, all caught up in these numbers. Hey, we haven't thrown for 200 yards in a couple games, but... You know, we're being really efficient, and you know, sometimes you got to take what the defense gives you. Sometimes you're not going to throw for 300 yards or 200 yards. You're going to have to run for 160, 175 yards when teams allow that to happen, and that's what we've been, we've been doing. I asked him if this is the most multiple they've been on offense because we've talked about it. I think it's pretty obvious, but I wanted to see what he had to say. And it's, to me, as a quarterback and a play caller, so both, and that's why I asked Zach and I asked Joe, if you feel like everything is at your disposal and you could throw it 50 yards downfield with a receiver or you could hit Tyler Boyd for a slant or hit C.J. Uzama, that's probably pretty freeing. But then you also have this running back who's playing at an all-pro level and this offensive line that's getting pushed and he's taking 58 carries for multiple awards over the past two weeks and leading your offense. Like That's got to be the best, most awesome feeling ever. And so that's why I asked it. And it's a pretty obvious, yeah, we're the, we're more multiple now, I think. But I was kind of curious what they thought. And they both said um, around the same thing. We thought Joe's quote was uh, a bit better. So that's the one we used. But, yeah, I, I think uh, the fun part to me is, is is they've gotten this running game established. So now I think defenses are going to start at some point adjusting to that. And then it should open up another wrinkle of this offense that we haven't necessarily had to see or just reopen the downfield passing game that we saw earlier in the year. The last few weeks we've seen that this team can do exactly what Joe Burrow just said and take what the defense gives them. And that's not very exciting for people that want this offense to look like Patrick Mahomes and the chiefs or Justin Herbert last year and the chargers or Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. Although I would argue that Aaron Rodgers and the Packers use their running game quite effectively as well with Aaron Jones and uh, Corey Dillon's, son aj Dillon, up there uh but the (laughs) fact that the bengals have been able to all right james i I know it's a bad joke i forgot his name i was stalling for time is what it was uh the fact that the bengals have been able to win a game two games with joe mixon carrying the load the offensive line carrying the load and joe burrow as he's pointing out not throwing for 300 400 yards and six touchdowns but Getting the throws when he needs them, a couple mm-hmm. mistakes aside, we talked about the couple mistakes or, or really one mistake. I, I take back that the interception was a really bad interception. Uh, I think I said that in our post game show, but 
this multifaceted approach will make them really hard to deal with. And it was especially mm-hmm. really hard to deal with for teams like the Chargers, I think, who love to be too high. Brandon Staley, of course, loves to be too high. We'll talk with David from Locked On Chargers about this. And the Chargers have been, the, I think I said this, the worst run defense mm-hmm. in the NFL this year. And that's skewed a little bit by early season results. They've been a little bit better lately, a little bit better. They played the Steelers. The Steelers can't run the ball, for example. But uh, the the fact is, if the Chargers want to take away Jamar Chase T against Tyler Boyd, that's not the end of the world for this offense anymore. And for Zach Taylor, Brian Callahan, Joe Burrow, that's got to be a great feeling. Yeah, I, I honestly, I can't remember the last time the Bengals offense was like that. Like Rudy was, Johnson? Yeah, it was the Carson Palmer era. It, it yeah. really was because even, even during the Andy Dalton, A.J. Green, it's not like they had dynamic runners. And then when they did in, you know, Jeremy Hill's rookie year, he was great, but they, they didn't have the passing game because AJ was dinged up and they had multiple injuries. Marvin Jones was injured. And I think Eifert was hurt that year. So yeah, they haven't had this. Plus Andy was the quarterback. And I think everyone knows that Burrow's better and has a higher ceiling than, than what Andy Dalton brought even in his prime. So even with those mistakes, you know, that, that Burrow's making, he's playing at a really high level. And so that's the part that's exciting to me is because hopefully, like we mentioned at the top, Trey Hopkins, his health, you know, Joe Burrow continues to get removed farther and farther away uh, from that ACL injury. So there's reason to believe that they could continue to get better. And they've scored 30, 31 or more points in five of their last six games. And part of that has to do with the defense, but part of it has to do with the offense. Uh, one other thing before we get to our crossover, uh, locked on Bengals, locked on Chargers, is this the biggest game of the season? Zach Taylor says, yeah, it is. A lot of ways feels like the biggest game of the year to us up to this point. You know, I know we've had divisional games that felt that way, but um, this is a team that's right in the thick of it in the playoff race. Uh, they're coming to our stadium. Um, and, and of all the games we play this year, we, we need the support of the fans more than any other. Just because where we are in the season, we're in December now, and a team that's, that's fighting for their playoff hopes and – they have talent all across the board. Uh, they have really good coaches. And, you know, it's it's we really got to set the tone in this month of December starting with this game. And so, again, it's they present challenges in, in all three phases. They have a uh, really good returner. Um, again, they've got talent on both sides of the ball, and they put them in really good positions to make plays. And so, um, again, we've, we've got to set the tone for this, this last stretch of the season starting with this one on Sunday. Shout out Yaz, Commissioner Yaz, by the way, did a, her first pep talk in a while and, and echoed Zach Taylor's words about the importance of the fans in this game. And I do think that it, from, from a leverage perspective, from a, from a what it does to the playoff odds perspective, yeah. it's, it's probably the, the biggest game of the season. And, and like me, Zach Taylor play, paying lip service to you know, some of the divisional games that have certainly been big. And will remain big. You know, the Baltimore Cleveland games left on the schedule, still very big games for them coming up. But this is the first time I feel like, and maybe he's not been asked a question about this, where we've had Zach Taylor place extra urgency on a game this year. Whereas in, in previous years or in previous games, it was the Raiders are desperate for a win, the Browns are desperate for a win, the Steelers are desperate for a win. It's been the other team every week, and this week we get Zach Taylor with the quote that is, yeah, this game, we, we recognize how important it is, and as a home game, shouting out the fans a little bit too. Yeah, I think Zach Taylor has looked at some of those playoff predictor odds in, in playoff chances because he knows, look, it it's the seventh seed versus the fifth seed, and if you win as the fifth seed and you distance yourself farther and farther from seven, well, guess what? It, it, it doesn't take a genius to realize that your playoff chances go yeah. up. All right. So that alone. And I think the the opponent, how talented they are, because damn, eight weeks ago, people were talking about the Chargers as Super Bowl contenders, like going into the season, dark horse Super Bowl contenders. They were me. They they were, though. And so I I think it is it is a huge game and and for a variety of factors. And that's why we'll uh, for our next four segments tomorrow's show and and up next with our crossover we're gonna dive into this matchup justin herbert versus joe burrow round one fight 
or don't fight, get to betonline.ag where you can win big right now. Maybe you want to bet on Joe Burrow being comeback player of the year, or maybe it's all about the Bengals not just making the playoffs, but winning the AFC North. Or, and I love this, because Zach Taylor is right now third, the third highest odds to win coach of the year. Who would have thought that coming into the year? Not me, but that's where the Bengals are. And who knows if they make a deep, uh, or not even a deep run here, but win four out of their next six or go five and one down the stretch, maybe he does win coach of the year. So check all of that out and start wagering today at betonline.ag. And right now you're going to get a 50% welcome bonus. It's free money. You make that first deposit, whether it's 50 bucks, hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, you get 50% extra on your deposit with promo code locked on. It's that simple. You go to betonline.ag, you make that deposit, use promo code locked on and boom, free money to wager on whatever you want. So check them out right now. Betonline.ag, promo code locked on. Betonline, where the game starts. It's that time of the week. It's time for Crossover Thursday, Locked On Bengals, Locked On Chargers. We've got David Drogemeyer from Locked On Chargers joining myself, Jake Lisko, and my co-host on the Locked On Bengals podcast, James Rapine. We're going to dive in to the Los Angeles Chargers and the challenges or opportunities they present to the Cincinnati Bengals coming up this weekend. And I think this starts, David, with the the number one story that everyone's talking about this week that we were ready to talk about for a primetime game that should have or could have been. And that's Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow, part one, the quarterbacks currently, despite a recent surge from Tua truthers, and they might have a case, are seen as the best quarterbacks out of last year's draft class and the first time they get to play each other. David, is Justin Herbert a better quarterback than Joe Burrow? You're, you're really going to ask me that question? That, that, that's, sure that's, 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 that's hilarious. Uh, personally, obviously, I'm going to say that Justin Herbert's a better quarterback. I mean, that's the team I cover. I love Joe Burrow, though. And, and here's the thing. These two guys are both playmakers. They're both excellent quarterbacks. Joe Burrow's got that personality that you like. He's kind of got that movie star kind of personality, I think. And Justin Herbert's a lot more reserved. He's a lot more quiet. Um, he's more of the lead by example versus a vocal type of leader, which I, I suspect Joe Burrow is more like that type of individual. One thing I do know is that both of these guys are going to be tearing up the AFC for the next decade plus, hopefully. And uh, I mean, what what talent, what talent that both of these franchises for the Chargers, it's crazy how they go, go from Philip Rivers straight to Justin Herbert. I mean, that is such a dream. I mean, just talk about talk to any of the other franchises. Talk to the Broncos. <laughs> How many quarterbacks have the Broncos cycled through in the last five years? Uh, I mean, look, ninety percent of the NFL it searches far and wide for a, a quarterback for that number one guy, and the Bengals and the Chargers they have them. Yeah, for sure. And that's what's really exciting about this matchup. Let's uh, let's focus in on Herbert specifically. And, and Bengals fans, don't get too mad at David because he picked Justin Herbert. But what? Uh, what is he doing in this system? How is he thriving compared to last year? Is it better? Is it worse? Obviously, the Chargers, there was dark horse Super Bowl contender talk right now. They're the seventh seed in the AFC. So expectations are pretty high. How is he faring sure. in, in this new system with this new coaching staff? So I think last year, there was a lot of deep shots, a lot of plays down the field. You, you saw a lot of the, the sexy 50 plus yard touchdowns and you're not seeing nearly as much of that this season. And I think that's, you know, it's not a, you know, as a, you know, attractive form of football to watch, but you know, this offense is very much a, a saint centric type of offense where Drew Brees was operating, where he'd really throw the balls to the flats, try to get the ball out of his hands quickly. Um, now there is a lot of freedom there, you know, with with uh, Keenan Allen and the kind of routes that he can he can run. He's you know they have rules guys, and then they you know they have the guys who can be creative and kind of you know do what they want almost. And uh, you know so you're seeing quite a bit of that with with the elder statesmen. But uh, I just I feel like the the concern here is a lot of Charger fans would love to see them push the ball down the field a lot more often than they do. But defenses are, they know that they know that Justin Herbert has the big arm. So they're intentionally playing the cover too. They're trying to take those deep shots away, those explosive plays away. And, and by all accounts it's happening. I mean, it, 
Justin Herbert is still having a great year statistically, but I don't think it's as explosive a brand of football that we saw last year in his rookie season. Is there something specifically going on the last few weeks to stay on the topic of this offense? Criticism from various national outlets seems to be bubbling up that Justin Herbert is being handcuffed the way he was at Oregon, being forced to take, you know, sit routes underneath when he has the ability to make any throw on the football field. And, you know, do you think that's because of offensive line injuries? Obviously, again, the Chargers, despite spending heavily in free agency, bringing in Corey Lindsley, drafting Rashawn Slater, both of those guys have been great. But injuries at left guard, right tackle, right guard. Is it because of those injuries on the offensive line creating problems? Is there something wrong with Justin Herbert, who I think I saw somebody tweeted he's, you know, the lowest quarterback or something in EPA per play in, since week nine? What, what's going on the last few weeks? Well, if you if you look at the offensive numbers, they're still one of the top offenses in the league. If you look at DVOA and all of that, they're they're top five in pretty much every statistical category as far as the, as they as they track. So they're still moving the ball down the field. I think what has really crippled you know Justin Herbert and the Chargers is they if they don't get off to a fast start, then they really have a hard time finding their rhythm. And if they if they can't they they can't really make the adjustments in game to really change things enough and they get into a hole, and then they can't dig themselves out of it. So that's one thing for sure. But also, a lot of defenses are trying to change the sight picture on Justin Herbert after the snap. They're going to show, they might show pressure, or they might show coverage beforehand, and then they will change things and make Justin Herbert have to really pick, make the right read and, and make the right throw. And that's something you know that he has struggled with. But one thing I want to continue to remind everyone is that he's a second-year quarterback. You know, he still has plenty to learn. Obviously, the expectations are astronomically high because of how much success that he has enjoyed so far in his short career. But he is still a work in progress. This this guy is still, I would say, scratching the surface as to where he can possibly get to. But that, I think, is what a lot of teams are doing to Justin Herbert. And the Chargers, unfortunately, haven't really adjusted enough to get past that hump. So is that his biggest flaw? And this is probably a quick answer, but is that his biggest flaw right now? Our biggest area that he needs to work on is his processing, you know, pre-snap and during the play. Definitely. I, w- I would say a hundred percent. That's the one thing that he needs to shore up. And the more he works with, uh, you know, a defensive mastermind like Brandon Saley, I, I think the, the more he's going to understand defenses and understand how they're trying to attack him and the better he's going to get. But the only cure that we can really have here is time and experience. The more defenses he sees, the better he's going to be able to make the decisions to outwit that defense. Let's talk about Brandon Staley's defense a bit. What uh, what's different uh, about this unit, and uh, and how do they in a a ideal world? How will they attack Mm -hmm. the Bengals? How will they attack Joe Burrow on Sunday? Yeah, I mean, so for Joe Burrow, the one thing that I've seen watching the tape on him is that he will take shots. He will take some unnecessary chances, and that's why he's thrown 12 interceptions this year, especially to the right side. He's thrown several deep to where they've gotten picked off. So I think they're really going to try to spot or keep you know a two-safety look. That's what Brandon Staley and the Chargers defense play most of the time. The biggest concern here is the run defense. They are by far the worst run defense in the league giving up 145 plus rushing yards per game. And the idea of Joe Mixon coming in uh, and running up against this very injured and very, uh, let's say, untalented defensive line scares the hell out of us because the last three games, the, the dude has been tearing the league apart. So that's the biggest thing that scares me. So I think they would probably like to try to take Joe Mixon away a little bit more. Uh, as much as as much as that that's a, an incredibly difficult task, and try to let Joe Burrow, you know, make those throws. Ideally, you know, you I think the offense is probably the best defense here. Try to get a lead because that's another thing I've seen against the Bengals is they get up really, really big in the first half, and they pretty much put the game away before you know the second half even gets started. So they really have to try to weather the storm against the Bengals if they can get a lead, if they can try to turn Joe Burrow over and try to limit Joe Mixon as much as possible. I think that's going to be the recipe for success against the Bengals. Sounds like both teams are very interested in controlling the game script in this one. Both teams, we've talked about that with the Bengals all year. Get off to a fast start. So it's not on Joe Burrow all game and it hasn't been for the last couple of weeks. How is Brandon Staley going to balance that with the success 
that the Bengals and Joe Mixon have had going under center, going 12 personnel, going even extra offensive linemen with two tight ends on the field and, and just say, we're going to run wide zone at you until you can stop it. Brandon Staley wants to keep both his safeties high. Is he going to start playing a guy in the box? And, and is, is what, what do you think the adaptation is? Is it as simple as under center, drop a safety in the box and shotgun, keep too deep like you want to do, or, or is he going to be truly too deep the entire game? No, he, he can't be too deep the entire game. If that, if that happens, Joe Mixon is going to ha- have a field day in this game. So what you're probably going to see is Derwin James in the box a whole lot more uh, in this game, particularly because, you know, th- that guy can do anything on the defensive field. I mean, no matter what you ask him to do, he can rush the passer. He can play in the box. He can play back. Derwin James is one of those rare athletes in the NFL, but he's best used closer to the football, especially when you have a playmaker, the caliber of Joe Mixon. He's so patient. And I think that's what makes him so effective is he, he doesn't really shuffle his feet. He, he waits for the hold to open up and then he explodes through it. Derwin James is a guy who can kind of match that explosiveness. So I expect to see him in the box a lot to try to contain that run game, at least as, as much as possible in the beginning. It'll be really interesting to see how Derwin James is employed. The Bengals have actually been doing, we talked about this in our film review episode this week, some motion in the direction of the running plays lately to try to force that safety rotation. And we talked about that. They want to get Nasser Adderley down in the box instead. It'll be interesting to see how they approach that. David Drogmeyer, Drogermeyer from Locked on Chargers. Appreciate the time and insight into the Chargers this week. And that's going to do it for this episode of the Lockdown Bengals podcast. Until next time, Bengals fans, who day and have a good one.